Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Spaulding with NWSID, and I'm joined today by Matthew and Frederick uh, from Chalo Home, downtown Portland. And I am so grateful that they have agreed to give us some time and tell us a little bit about their shop and their design work. Uh, welcome, guys. Hi, Hello. Peter. Hi, everybody. Um, so we are uh, in a series of talks that are all about finding our niche as designers. And I think uh, Frederick and Matthew really exemplify that here in the Portland community. Um, they do really strong, um, traditionally bent work. Although I don't know, do you guys like the word traditional? We do, we do. We do, okay. And, and is that how you would describe your work? Or are there some other adjectives that you would employ? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that as kind of the um, common denominator in, in describing what we do. Um, I do feel that traditional elements are, 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 are necessary to some extent. Uh, even when we do things that are completely contemporary in um, contemporary architecture and or condos. Um, I think that some classic elements will always help uh, add character and pull the whole interior together. Great, so um, I, I'm already veering off my questions, but you brought up working in contemporary settings like condos, which I think a lot of us here end up doing. So when you get there and there's no, um, I don't want to say no architecture, but when there are no, when there's no supporting language, what's your first kind of move? Uh, typically, uh, it depends on the, the uh, breadth of the, the job. Are we uh, doing a complete uh, remodel or are we just trying to make it feel more homey? Um, we do everything from um, gutting a condo to also just giving a cosmetic lift. <clears throat> um, so a lot of it depends on what the customers are after. We're working on a condominium right now that I think was finished in the 90s, late 90s, and has a lot of brown woodwork. Um, the clients from the south and moved here and feels it's a bit too masculine. So in that respect, we talk about budget and from the budget, that's where we start making recommendations as far as um, what we can do with built-in cabinetry. We typically take it all out. Sometimes we're able to salvage some of it and just give it a, a paint job or add some trim. Um, but then there's other cases where the clients um, don't want their unit to look like anyone else's unit. So every pretty much every wall that is non-load bearing gets moved. Um, and uh, we've gotten quite adept to doing full construction. Uh, we, we work with a lot of uh, clients that have hired architects and um, we end up with a lot of clients that didn't feel the architects were speaking their, their language or understanding what they were after. Um, and but, but we even have a, a client that we're just starting with. Their architect told them that they should hire an interior designer to help with the finessing and the finishing touches because he was not interested in that. Um, he was really just interested in in creating the architecture and and the that concept. Um, and what usually happens in that, in that, in those cases is, um, I think we obviously are educated differently than an architect. Um, so we think from a different perspective and we think of maybe how people are gonna live in it, not how it looks. Um, so we typically, in this case, we really weren't hired to change much other than pick finishes. Um, we happened to throw out a couple of ideas that we thought would improve the space. And um, we, we flew out, the, the clients have another condo that they love in Honolulu. 
So we flew out there to sort of examine what they loved about it. And it really was all about light and um, being part of nature, which Portland uh, down here in the Pearl uh, doesn't feel like Honolulu when you open the windows. <laughs> Uh, and we really realized a lot of what the architect had designed uh, closed it in even more. So we threw out some ideas of creating more of an openness, more of a flow, and um, they really were interested. So they're having us expand on those ideas. So, I, I mean, it is really great when an architect senses that a designer will be helpful because that implies hopefully that you go into a project and aren't super at odds with one another. Right. Yeah. And I think that that comes with um, working with people that have um, some, some kind of seniority and or experience and they they're confident in what they bring as far as an architect. Yes. As far as an architect is concerned, what they bring to the equation you know, they, they get paid for their design and they don't want to get stuck in picking out tile or, or cabinet hardware or things like that. Yeah. Um, and, and they can move on to their next project and, and, and not get stuck in, in the details. In the stuff that you guys like to do. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's get on to the actual things I intended you to, to ask you. Um, and th starting with when did you guys open your shop and what sort of prompted you to do that? I think it was, um, a bit of insanity had befallen us. Um, you know, I think it was around, it's, uh, 2000, the year was 2000. So we're going on our 22nd year now, um, I had always uh, dreamt of opening a shop, uh, probably since college. I didn't know what type of business or shop per se. It was just that I wanted to do a business. And um, when I moved to Portland, I had moved from uh, Amsterdam. And there were so many interesting stores that were there that were not here. And they called them lifestyle stores. Um, where they sold everything from women's accessories to pet supplies to home goods. And, and this was in the 80s, say? Probably the 80s. So yeah. it, it's really kind of um, a brand that everyone probably will recognize as Terrence Conran's Habitat. That wasn't in Amsterdam, but that concept is what inspired those types of European shops. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, um, I, was, I had moved to Portland uh, for a corporate job and a couple of uh, friends had asked me to think of some business ideas for them. I came up with um, sort of what I would have done if I had um, the, the time and money to do a shop and came up with a lifestyle store. So I did a few of those for friends that wanted businesses or had businesses that weren't that great and they wanted to rebrand. So I did that for many, many years. And after I met Matthew and learned of his love of antiques and his family's entrepreneurial background, which matched, uh, was very similar to my upbringing, um, we decided that we, would want our own shop. So we worked on that and uh, Cielo is the culmination of that. Matthew was still dancing in the ballet at the time. So he would um, work on the weekends and after work in the evenings. And uh, it was just the two of us for about a year or so, but that's how we, mm -hmm. how we started. And it started as a full retail store at that time. And did you ever sleep? It, it's we must have. It's interesting <laughs> because it seemed like we would have really long days and be here until midnight. And I don't know why. It just I think it was just a different time. Also, we were learning. It was pre Amazon. Yeah. Right. So, so, so the things that we would sell, you there, you couldn't. There was no internet. Right. Like you couldn't go online and 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 find them. 
So we were constantly restocking. Yeah. So, uh, so we had things that, you know, you had to come here as a destination to source. Yeah. And, and you sort of created a beautiful world that could seduce people into, to, to purchasing it. So I'm thinking we wanted to create, our idea was always to create an escape. We felt that people that um, maybe were having a hard day or just wanted to get away from work or whatever they were going through in life, we wanted to create a bit of theater. We wanted yeah. to create an escape, something pretty. Um, we sort of melded that in with all our business practices about not asking people too many questions, making it very simple for them to be in the space, um, serving. And wander yeah. and discover things. Definitely a, a, a touch of some fantasy has always and romance has always been kind of part of the DNA of the shop and also of our work. I, I think that's, um, I mean, now is as complicated and outlying time, one hopes, but um, you don't necessarily wander into a lot of romance downtown Portland. And that's not to say that historically there hasn't been some fun shopping, but I think people here take themselves pretty seriously in a modern idiom. And so the fantastical sometimes is hard to find. So it's pretty wonderful to walk into your store and experience such a contrast. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I do feel like there are some tried and true kind of career retailers that we have in our community. Um, definitely Patty Merrill and Bridget from Cargo. Uh -huh, you know, they've, yeah. they've moved around the town and now they're in Southeast. Uh, Tim O'Hearn from French Quarter. These are people that I feel like it's in their blood. retail is like in their blood. It's, it's a passion for them. Yeah. It is, retail is very, very difficult though. Yeah. And, um, and I feel like you, you really have to love it to, to, to put in the hours and the effort. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so stay away is your advice. <laughs> I, I think there's other ways that you can be successful at InDesign, especially- Yeah, it depends what your passion it is. Depends, it, it depends, it depends. You know, I, I feel like um, it is difficult with, with Amazon and the internet all designers, I think, not all, but many of us, we get price price shopped by our clients. And, yeah. you know, that's just a factor. So, you know, yeah, it's a complicated um, thing to work through with each individual client because some would never go online and look. At right. A, a show them, and then there's others that they just see it either as a game or they want to be smarter than the average bear and, and find it cheaper than you. So there are many, many other ways, as we all know, that um, you can make money much easier. We're, um, <laughs> we, we you don't open a shop and um, go into business thinking that you're going to um, uh, have an easy life and um, get rich. Get rich. Um, it's something that is is calling you or your vocation or something that you wake up and you just want to do it. And I think everyone in our, most people in our field feel that way. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I mean, not that it doesn't happen, but I wouldn't recommend the field of design if your intent is to get rich. Because right, right. You, you have to work ceaselessly for that uh, yes. to happen, I think. Um, even the people at the top who make it look very simple. I, I don't think they're sleeping too much. Um, uh, so, but did this, uh, having this shot, did it lead you naturally into design projects? Was it an intent when you opened that you would also take on design work or was that something organic? It, it was, it was not, um, would you say it was even organic? Uh, I don't even know if it was organic. I, I do, I, I do know it was not part of a business strategy or plan. I know that people liked us and they liked our taste, 
And so they would ask for, for advice and help. And if we were delivering something or if movers were delivering something, oftentimes we would go along for the delivery and then it would just, it just kind of grew from there. People just asked our advice. And that's when we decided that we would, we would do design. And that was maybe I don't know, 18 or more years ago. I think a lot of it was our, our, our impression of what a designer was, was um, what a lot of designers do is they go to school, they learn how to draft, they learn CAD, they, they can sketch beautifully. Um, and we never considered ourselves as such. We thought we were retailers and we help people make things look pretty. Um, as we progressed and people kept saying that you guys need to get it, people were really pushing us to do it. And we just said, no, there's no time in the day to even think about it. Um, and as time went by um, and we started to get more involved with um, design <clears throat> groups and um, especially with uh, Parker and Kravit having a lot of uh, lectures, we just started going to as many lectures from um, people we admired, uh, designers, and one in particular was Barbara Berry. And she, and she didn't have any professional training. She said she couldn't sketch a smiley face if uh, she <laughs> had to. Um, and that started giving, started giving us the idea that, you know, if it's a love that we have and people like our work, it doesn't matter. And I, I think that in the early days, what, what, how we saw ourselves is we were really stylists uh, in yeah. a sense. And that's obviously changed because now we um, we do designs for full-on construction and 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 you know building homes from the ground up. Um, but I, I don't. I think to it, it, it diminishes what we do if, if we just say that we started off doing pretty things. I believe that both of our backgrounds really informed our knowledge and our taste and, and, and interest in things, artistic um, and beautiful. So, so yes, I, I've always been interested in the performing arts because I was a dancer. And when I was a young person and I lived in New York, I would see ballet and other uh, galleries and go to museums. And I feel like that was just as valuable an education um, as you know going to college and getting a degree. Frederick's business acumen, I think, comes from his degree is is in marketing and um, business business and business development. <clears throat> so we're a good match. Plus, he's also very artistic and. The way his mind works is very mechanical. So when it comes to construction and um, things like that, you know, he he's done he's remodeled old homes. Like in a previous life, even before we knew each other, he would he he had flips some houses. So he can talk the talk with a contractor because he knows he's done those things himself. Yeah, and I know nothing about that. I just say let's make this you know this doesn't look right or that right so you handle mostly uh furniture yeah. color materials but the one main um, impetus for us to get in design was was one client in particular um we had been doing smaller styles uh, what do you call it um styling and smaller jobs of just helping people do a room etc and we had a dear client who's still uh, we still work for quite a bit. Um, she asked us to have a meeting with her and um, we had no idea what she wanted to talk about. And uh, she said, well, I, I know you guys know that we're working on a, a big project in our backyard. They were designing uh, quite an expensive um, set of pool pavilions and a swing pool and a catering um, space and gardens in their backyard and she was having so many issues with the architects not listening to what she wanted. Um, she wanted a bit of fantasy. She wanted a bit of um, what's that? 
Coo, Coo Gardens, is that how you pronounce it? Um, in England. And um, she wanted to hire us to finish the design and to redo the design. And we, we were sort of saying, excuse me, we've never even done an interior and you want us to start handling this very large scale job. And she said, well, I trust you guys. Um, so we took over this job and it was so nerve wracking. So this was about 12, 15 years it's ago. Long, it's longer than that. But it's on our website. It's our very first job. It's, um, I think it's, it's titled Upcountry Folly. Uh, that was our very first job. And we designed it from the ground up um, penciling, putting paper to pencil, um, meeting with the drafter, having that put into um, CAD and um, positioning ourselves on the property, measuring how high windows should be, how high the roof should be, how far the pool should be away from. Um, and so it was, it, we were thrown in with the lions and we had to do everything from uh, pool scaping to uh, electrical, plan. electrical. Uh, there was a kitchen involved, bathroom involved, pump rooms. And, and, and now, um, you know, we have a staff of people that help us with those, those things. But back then it was just us and some paper. Isn't it annoying when you're in this position where you do have some pretty valuable knowledge and the electrician looks at you like, you idiot, why the heck don't you know my whole job and you're just like why would i know your whole job you know oftentimes with electricians they they will think that we've specified too many lights mm. or too many ways of controlling the light or, yeah and yeah. they but the clients in the end get it and they love it and they love that they can really control the mood and the ambiance of this of the setting we, we like we, what 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 we have found is we like working with um, for high end jobs. We like working with the same subcontractors, yeah, yeah. Or, or if we can, the same contractors because we really get in the groove and we're really trying to now emphasize that need to work with people that we have either worked with or that the client has actually worked with firsthand, not. Just you're, uh, you're, heard from you're, our neighbor. You're or speaking something. the same language, really. Yeah, for me, it's really a deal breaker if you won't agree to use my subcontractors. Like, yeah. I'm not going to manage a bunch of people. Yeah. I don't know. It's I don't, a nightmare. I don't come into your office and tell you yeah. to fire these employees and get new ones that I know. So that doesn't, you know, you because because my neighbor got a deal or something. Right, like, like that's yeah. irrelevant to how this is going to work. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think that's really um, smart. Um, okay, you guys, uh, well, I'm curious, Matthew, outside of dance, where did you, how did you start to learn about antiques? And when you are bringing stuff into a project or into your shop, what are some of the criteria that you're thinking about? Uh, my, my background um, in antiques really is from my grandparents. They had an antique wholesale business in Pennsylvania um, when I was young. Uh, and so I was always around that. Um, I think a lot of it was absorbed through osmosis. It's not like, you know, like I would just hear, oh, that's, this chair is the Chippendale style chair, you know, like whatever. Um, and that would just kind of stick in my mind. Yeah. Um, and so that's how I learned about it at first. Then over the years, um, just from our, in the early days, we, when we opened, we would do containers of furniture from Europe. Um, that's probably- We actually went there and- Yeah, it was a different time. And I think that the dollar was very strong. It yeah. was not as, it was pre 9-11. It was a much simpler um, process. Now I think it's kind of cost prohibitive to, to really do that. Um, but that's, you know, I think like anything, it's just practice. The more you, if you're interested in something, 
and you seek out knowledge and information, um, you're just going to get better at it. So I, I know, a, I know, you know, quite a bit now. We, but, we, but you, so does Frederick. He's very, we've, we've just absorbed and yeah. we've, yeah. we've uh, attracted mentors that have aided us in the year, through the years, great antiquers and great designers that we've become friends with that have really put us on the right path. And, and, and you know, you, any, any designer, I would guess, you know when something looks right and you know yeah. when something does. Yeah. Um, so it's a world of hunters, I think. And that it's sort of gotten flattened a little bit by this huge movement online. So uh, outside of actual purchasing, has the hunt diminished for you? Or are you still able to go have fun and relish in finding stuff that you love? We have a lot of, we have too much fun yeah. finding the things that we love. Ask our CPA. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we, we, we still have a lot of fun doing that. We try to incorporate it into every trip we take. Um, okay. And what we have found is because we've done it so long, we still have contacts um, with people. Hopefully, you know, the son or daughter has taken over for the parents by now or someone else has taken over their business. And that could be in New York. It could be in Arizona, but it could also be in, you know, uh, Angers, France. Um, so just people everywhere, um, we still stay connected with the one thing that's really changed is the cost, um, of acquiring it and then also shipping it. Um, the shipping as you've probably encountered is usually more than what it costs to buy it. And it used to be so different when we could fill a container and, and get it here for, under five thousand dollars, and I from. and I also feel like when we were younger, we would take on quote unquote projects. We would say, "Oh, that chair has good lines. someday we'll we fix re, it. Re, we can paint it. We can recover it." We tend to not do that as much now because it's just a matter of you know, like storage etc because we, of the cost of everything and storing things storing isn't. things is expensive and also really fixing something up properly um it, it's an investment so we try and if we do find things we try and find things that are pretty much ready to sell we're a bit yeah. of perfectionists in terms of when we find something we we aren't the types that would just slap on some fabric and upholster it ourselves we um, really we'll take it yeah. apart, have it steamed and sanitized and have all the guts taken out and it's a new have it piece of furniture when you and give it a new life. And that sometimes is to our detriment because it is very, especially today, it's very expensive to um, get that done and the time that it takes now with and also to get your money out of it, it it's kind of it's kind of hard. To get your so money out of it, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. do if you invest yeah. in nice fabric, the upholstery, the painting or the refinishing. Um, and you're paying people a living wage. Yeah, it's, it, just, yeah. it's, it's, it's simple. We want to keep things a little simple. And do you find that even your, um, you know, your design clients, you, you still would want to keep things simpler for them or are there people who will go and- For them, it's, for them, it's a different story. Yeah. For them, yes, we do. Uh, we do give things facelifts. We do uh, give new life to um, family pieces, family heirlooms, things that are things that have sentimentality to them. You know, they might they might be those. Everyone, almost everyone, they have that one chair or that that chest or something that belonged to their grandmother or their grandfather. And it's hard for them to part with it. Well, you know, maybe now we, as we're working through designing a space, we don't necessarily have to say send it to Goodwill, send it off to wherever, you know, give it some pride of place. 
you know, fix it up, fix the veneer, make sure the hardware looks good or recover it in a fabulous new fabric. And I think that's important because we are very romantic in that sense. Um, Sentimental. I, I do feel like we've never gone into a house and said, get rid of everything because I think it's disrespectful to the client. Yeah. I can't imagine doing that. I know that some designers do that. I would never ever have the guts to do that or the desire to do that. I mean, if you've gotten to the point where you can afford to hire a designer, in my mind, you must own a couple of things that you actually care about. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I would hope. Yes. I, yeah. We well, yes, that, that's true. Occasionally, maybe not. But one, one tip, though, is if you do go into someone's home and they're over the age of 30 and they don't have anything, there's a reason why they don't have anything. And it's a red flag and don't take the job. <laughs> Interesting. That's, I feel like I've thought of a lot of red flags. That's not one I've considered. Oh, so, yes. We what? used to get so excited. To get we so we excited. think, oh, they don't have anything. They need a whole house of furniture. And usually it's people that don't okay. really, can't commit to, to things or- yeah, they have commitment issues. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And maybe yes. they're just hiring you to be a friend and not really buy anything. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't like hired friendships as much as, as unhired ones. Yeah. Um, interesting. Thank you for that tip. I have not been observant enough to, to realize that. Um, so I might be biased because like you guys, I love old things. Uh, but I have been noticing an uptick of interest generally in the last few years in, um, I think, an aesthetic that you practice well. Are you feeling that locally? Would you agree with that? We, we, we've we always, and chime in if, if I'm leaving anything out, we've always had a, a, a very loyal following that appreciates those things. I have read recently that because of um, people, because of COVID and the boom in people being on Instagram, Instagrammable interiors um, are, are kind of- People are tired of them. Yeah. Yeah. The what's up? People are tired of them. No, no, I, I was going to say that people want their, their interiors to be Instagrammable. Oh, okay. So, okay. So they, you know, they don't want it just to be kind of dull and beige. And they, I they, see what you're they, they want things that do have some interest. And personality. And personality. I thought when you said Instagrammable, you meant white and black with a fern. But you mean no. something that's compelling. Well, maybe, the, maybe there are people out there on Instagram, but the people that I, I follow, creative people, um, like name a couple so um, like for us and uh yes miles and you know like you know people that a lot of de designers know like miles red yeah. i also love amanda cutter brooks yeah um, who who's fabulous it's it's, it's maybe luke uh, edward hall luke, Ed luke edward hall is like another great example um there's he layers does, um those painted lampshades too that i really want well he paints on everything but uh yes yeah. but there's we were in a boutique in new york and he had been flown in to paint the walls so uh, cool but there's layers and there's interest it's like looking at the interior of your space right now it's, it's a very graphic um, yeah color story and i think that on camera reads really well so with people being stuck at home doing zoom and doing doing things like that working from home i've read that a lot that people are, are have a renewed interest in making their home special. So that should be beneficial for all of us, I would assume. I think so. I mean, I think the evidence, there's been pretty strong evidence of that this year in everybody's business. Um, I also was listening to a podcast. I can't remember if this, a business of home episode or what, but they had some like macro trend analyzer on who said, you know, the previous 10 years, the, the macro trend for a consumer was green. And during the pandemic, it has made a, a huge shift to emotion. And I think that that seems true in the people that I've encountered. Um, 
as you're saying, they're much more desirous of something that just really um, warms them up and feels good. Um, I think um, in the beginning of COVID, especially when people that typically dressed up, went to a fancy office, um, dealt with fancy clients, attorneys, doctors, what have you, and uh, COVID hit, a lot of them had to make do with areas in their house uh, to do meetings and Zoom meetings. And we got calls from a lot of people at that time saying, I can't believe what people are seeing of my house. Can you come help me? And that turned into a lot of bigger jobs. Yeah. But we had one dear client who the only place she had, she had two boys running around the house, but the only place she could get away was her entry. And she had oh, no. a big table set in her entry. So the kids were coming in and out all, and she's an attorney. So they were coming out through, right. um, through that. And we just found more and more people that realized or they would see other people in their environments. Um, we're all witness to this when Anderson Cooper was on uh, TV and everybody's looking at his interior and you know different people are on you're like, oh, is that what the, it looks like? Uh, so people were getting excited about maybe maybe I need to catch up or maybe I need to put some money or time into where I live because I haven't been paying attention to it. Um, so a little bit of that happened as well. Because mine doesn't look as good as Anderson Cooper's. Is that what you're saying? That, as if you're so, a third person. Yes. yes. Well, <laughs> and depending, depending on the personality of the client, I think oftentimes get, letting, giving the client um, the the confidence to invest in themselves and invest in their personal space, I think is important. Um, yeah. It's sometimes hard to get to that point, but, but once you get there, it, it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, interesting. Um, have you ever like question your aesthetic? And, and that's not like, have you ever been critic? Have you ever been like, do I like what I'm doing? Do, are, are, is this landing with people? And what gives you the confidence to, to stay true? Well, are you talking more about the shop or design or? Um, I don't, I think you can, you can determine. I, oh, it, with I, the shop, of course it happens. It happened all the time. I think the last, now for the last 10 years, we feel much more confident in what we do. But, um, you know, anytime there's a crisis like 9-11 um, or the stock market crash um, and thoughts and um, tastes shift dramatically, there's always sort of that thought like we need to redo it. We need to rebrand it. We need to be more sympathetic or we need to be uh, you know, gentler, kinder. There's just different things because it's sort of, it's a, our business is a living thing. So we have to keep it nourished and to keep it updated. Um, so there are many times just in terms of questioning our taste uh, during the period where there were, were maybe five or six modern shops around us. And we thought maybe we need to be more modern. Um, and maybe people want more modern things. Uh, and you get very sensitive to, oh, maybe you didn't make the sales that you made the last year and then that week. But being in retail, you there's no gauge of- But a, of very, important, high, you know. a very important lesson that we, it's, a, it's good to experiment. We experimented at one point years ago with truly having um, real vignettes, vignettes that were a true, design concept yeah and, um we thought it was a great idea we thought maybe that's what people want maybe and so that will work people came in and they said oh it was so beautiful but they didn't really buy anything and they missed the sense of discovery and that they have when they come in and so we went back to kind of what we did originally um, there was also a period where we had to educate the public into realizing that when you come into the shop, this isn't what, this is not how we would do your house. 
Um, Interesting. I don't feel like, yeah, I feel like we don't need to do that anymore. I think people get it because of uh, social media and things we post. And and, most of our clients um, are referred by other yeah. clients and they've seen the work. Um, so, you know, especially at that time, we were years ago, we were very hev- heavily into very um, fanciful Frenchy types of things. Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, a couple would come in and the husband would be like, no, I don't want, <laughs> this is not what we want. And Get me out of so, here. Yeah. Yes. So that we, 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 we don't get that anymore, but the yeah. shop also isn't very Frenchy right now. Uh, and, ter- and in terms of, um, do we question our design taste in terms of our design business? Um, I never really find us uh, questioning it. I find it uh, reaffirmed many times. Um, and that makes us feel even better. Like when we travel, we go to Italy or France and, you take some house tours or you um, are invited to someone's home. You're like, okay, this is a very sophisticated person. They really enjoy life. Um, And their interiors are a mix. They're fun. There's a a bent, an angle to it. And um, it's just full of things that you love, but it's done well. And um, so we just get more excited about our taste and what we've done. Um, a lot of times at our at our home we think oh it's gotten to this or to that but we go home every night and we just love it so that's really what we try to give our clients and it turns it can be anything from something super contemporary which we're always surprised at when people hire hire us to do something contemporary um or it could be something very fanciful um but we we just really try to pull out the best of what the client wants. And so really there is no question in terms of our taste because we're really trying to satisfy theirs. Yeah. We don't, you know, I know I have friends that are designers that they, they limit their color palette to like a very edited kind of thing. And that's what they like to do. Yeah. And that's what people hire them to do um, as an example we everything we every job we do is really catered to the individual so they're all very different so we rarely yeah, reuse we rarely, samples yeah. finishes fabrics um it, it becomes quite uh, a task to get rid of we really, samples here yeah we yeah. really don't we don't really have a signature look per se yeah um that that you would recognize i think some of our most most successful jobs um are very well done very inviting but maybe if you didn't know maybe you would just walk in and say oh the the homeowner has great taste you wouldn't walk in and say oh this is designed I think that that is the mark of a, the very the very highest mark a designer could receive is someone not really perceiving you'd been there. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's what the footprint we try to leave is. We try to encourage the clients to uh, focus on a collection that they had, and maybe they didn't even know they had it, um, or they kept picking up the same thing on their trips, textiles or ceramics, et cetera. And really we as outsiders realize they have a real affinity for glass or blown glass or textiles. So we start incorporating those into their interiors and that gets them very excited and it makes them feel good for you know something that they loved as well. It's not just a tchotchke or a pile of fabrics in the corner of a study. So we try to incorporate their loves into we should probably get to wrapping up, but you said something about, well, you touched on accessorizing and I'm always kind of like, this is a part of a project that I find the most difficult because to me, it's very personal. Um, and when, uh, you know, if you're in a, you're, you're looking at a catalog of new stuff and you're like, am I going to put this on somebody's bookshelves? Like this random Sputnik, what does this mean to anybody? How, how 
what is a conversation about those final touches kind of uh, look like? I think you already hinted at it, but. I don't know if it's really much of a conversation. What I like bookcases, which I, I hear from designers that come and shop with us to source product and accessories. Um, a lot of designers struggle with that. Um, what I, I think a good way of approaching it is if you're working with a client that has a lot of stuff, you just ask them questions. What does this mean to you? Is this, can, you know, is, right. is, is this just here because there was nowhere else to put it? Um, do these books mean anything to you? Um, you know, there are some clients that have a vast amount of books, and then there's clients that have none. And then, you know, it, it's, it's all over the map. But I do feel like uh, 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 an arrangement of bookcases, most people, they can be improved. And yeah. how you improve it is just by, you have to start somewhere. You know, start with one shelf and build right. from there. Right. But we're as sentimentalists, we it's very important, probably a bit like you, Peter. Um, things sort of have to have meaning. Um, yeah. Going to West Elm, you could get a great chair, etc. But then you get this Sputnik, and it sits on the table. And uh, for for us, it doesn't work. For a lot of people, it does. Yeah. Um, for us, we want something from our travels or from a shop that we love, or maybe was a gift from someone that means a lot to us. But I think for designers as well, the, the designers I always admire around town, uh, when they do come in for accessories, they usually will take a lot of things on approval. And right. Phil will we'll say, come back tomorrow, we'll have everything wrapped up. We have everything you know, on a sales order. And then they take it and um, what sticks, sticks. And um, I think you have to have the options. And that's one thing that is sort of fortunate for us is that we can bring a lot of things to someone's house, um, but also designers can come here and take as much as they want and, and see what works. But um, for us, it's a very personal thing. So it just depends on the story of the design and the history of the people. And it's oftentimes, you, it's better to bring too much. And then, because the most clients are gonna have to say no to something. Right, yeah. I have And then you get the for the thing. husband to say no. Yeah, yeah right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's terrific advice. Um, okay, what, uh, what is my last question for you? I guess we're, we're almost at an hour here. So sh I should just ask if there's anything else you, you guys feel really strongly about, um, particularly as advice to a young designer setting out, um, but anything that you feel like we haven't covered. Um, you want me to go first? Sure. I think as um, a young designer um, know that uh, it, we always tell um, new employees, look at someone that you admire or find someone that you admire. For us, uh, it's Bunny Williams and Miles Red and different people and we follow them and follow their business practices. We've been lucky to um, spend some time with Bunny and pick her brain and- um, Su Suzanne Reinstein is a- Yeah, Suzanne Reinstein. A very kind Such person. And so, work. so start- following the people that that you admire and every time you're making a decision think how would this person do it or would this person put up with this yes. or put up with that know your worth um, everybody says make sure you have boundaries. agreements and boundaries um, it's hard in the beginning but work towards them but um, I would say know that you're going to have to put in a lot of work um, as in seeing a lot of interns interns say, no, I want to be drawing the pool, not um, looking for different uh, consistencies or textures for concrete. Um, uh -huh. there, uh, I went to school for design. It's so know that you'll get there and know that depending on how, how much you love it, 
and how you, much you want to get out of it. It will take a lot of work and it'll take a lot of love and it'll take a lot of ups and downs and upset um, people and happy people. Um, but you just want to make that balance more of the happy people. Um, it's the those try to, try to... happy moments that keep you going, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, thank you guys both. Or Matthew, were you about to say something else today? Oh, I, one thing that I was just going to quickly say is, I think um, in anything, in any field, you just have to continue to educate yourself, I feel. Because um, you just, it's, it's practice and it's education and um, being open to, to learning and seeing new things, I think is very important. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely a great suggest or great thing to say. I think um, I know that this is sort of a controversial viewpoint. I think the design school can be very important, especially where learning systems to actually implement your design are concerned. But sometimes I think that it's very heavily focused on the technical and not about like expanding your mind and becoming a student forever. And I think that's where some work um, falls flat is that you can see that the creator isn't maybe interested in right. all kinds it's of It's like things. a lot of design schools are producing really great drafts people. Right. Instead uh, of artists or, or designers. Yeah, this is an but, art. But, yeah. ex but expanding your your eye, I think, is, is is crucial because the first time you see um, when we used to see people in athleisure, for example, right. on the street, it was kind of like, oh, like, are, are they lazy? Are they, you know, just schlepping around? And now it's become, it, it can be very posh, it can be very stylish, and it can right. be fashion, and it can look very upwardly mobile, even in a sense um you know sneakers there's it used to just be everybody bought a nice pair of nikes now all these big fashion houses are are making a, a quite a fortune off of these very cool looking designer sneakers so but our eyes had to adjust to that and and it's just like looking at any anything art yeah. dance movies the first time you watch a movie, you might hate it, but if that sticks in right. your mind, give things a chance. And if it sticks in your mind and you keep revisiting it, day for, for days after, then that that was an important um, piece of art. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, now we are at one hour and one minute, probably because I feel like I could talk to you guys forever. Um, so thank you, thank you for your time. Um, I hope you have a, you. a bunch of great projects this year and um, Thank you. hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Likewise, likewise. Bye. Bye. Bye.